Hi, thank you for letting me speak to you tonight about Arctic ice management, which is a term I coined, which means two things to me. It means a, a call to arms to do something to preserve and restore the sea ice in the Arctic, and also a possible means of doing so. And you may be wondering, Steve, you are an astrophysicist, you are a planetary scientist, what are you doing talking about the Arctic? Uh, is so far away, especially from Arizona. Uh, we in the desert. Maybe you have a romantic notion of the Arctic as I do. It is this distant place. You know, nobody even visited the Arctic, uh, the North Pole, until 1926. So it's only been a century that people have explored its full extent. And it seems as a, a place that is uh, ancient and unchanging and difficult to cross. And so we may remember that there were people who were attempting to go through the Northwest Passages, these areas in the uh, northwest part of Canada for centuries. And this is a depiction of the 1830s attempt where a ship is mired in the ice, and in 1845, the doomed expedition of Franklin. This is not an easy place to get to. We think it's formidable, ancient, unchanging. But it's not. It is changing rapidly. This is a more recent picture of the Nordic Orion, which is a cargo ship which in 2013 carried coal from Vancouver through the Northwest Passage to Finland. And even more recently, last September, you could have booked a cruise on the Crystal Serenity cruise ship, which went through the Northwest Passages, something that people had tried for centuries to do, but it is now something that can be done for tourism. Things are changing the Arctic rapidly. The passages are open. It's an historic event. We are going to see this more and more as the years go by, says the director of the National Snow and Ice Data Center. What is changing in the Arctic is simple to understand. The Arctic is melting. As climate change is happening and temperatures are increasing, we have increasingly less ice in the Arctic. This is a graph depicting the amount of ice, the volume of ice in thousands of cubic kilometers versus every month of the year. So this is the normal trend. This is the average from the 80s and 90s and 2000s of how much ice there is in January. It is maximized at the end of Arctic winter in April. It melts during the summer and is a minimum in September. And then it freezes again during the Arctic winter. And the gray band denotes the, the average amount and what is normal, the one and two sigma levels. These colored lines show the results from the seven most recent years. And you can see that every year, less ice exists in the winter, less ice freezes in the winter, more ice melts in the summer. And the red line is this year. And this is hot off the presses, quite literally. This is a record low amount of ice for this time of year. If you plot the amount of ice that exists at the maximum time, this time of year, the end of the winter, every year it's getting smaller. And this is the amount that exists at the end of the summer, the minimum amount. And every year it's getting smaller. These trends tell us that every year there's 300 cubic kilometers less ice on average than the year before. And to visualize this, imagine an ice cube four miles on a side. We have one less of those every year. And there aren't an infinite number of these ice cubes. As you can see, these trends pass the line of zero ice by the end of the summer in around 230, 2030. And that's a time when we'll have no ice in the Arctic at the end of the summer, and that's an unprecedented event. Graphs are one thing. I think this visual will help you visualize what's going on. This is a depiction of the satellite imagery from NASA of how much the ice extends over the Arctic during September of each year. And from the dawn of the satellite era in the late 70s through the 80s, you have a typical amount of ice at the end of the summer over half of the Arctic's covered. But starting in the late 90s, you start to see that the extent of the ice is significantly less. And the years 2007 and 2012 are particularly low. And this is happening more and more each year. So it's easy to see how. We are quickly reaching a state where there will be practically no sea ice at the end of the summer. And that's bad for the Arctic. Multi-year ice is stronger. Without multi-year ice, ice that persists through the summer, uh, it's harder for ice to freeze in the winter, and the ice is weaker and more easily disrupted and carried southward. So this matters as well for the reflectivity of the Earth. 
The Arctic is the world's air conditioner. It reflects back a lot of sunlight. The sea ice is reflective, but in 2012, this much area of the Arctic was missing ice compared to a typical year of 1979. This area was much darker than uh, previous years, and that is because sea ice reflects back over 90% of the sunlight that hits it, whereas once that ice melts and you have open ocean, it absorbs over 90% of the sunlight. This is a runaway process. Once you melt ice and the sunlight is absorbed into the ocean, the temperatures increase, and that makes it easier for the ice to melt and makes it harder for it to freeze again in the winter. And we call this the ice albedo feedback. Albedo is the ability of something to reflect light. And that feedback is one of the reasons why temperatures are increasing faster in the Arctic than anywhere else. This is a graph from 1880 to the present day of global temperatures, that's the black line, and they have increased by about a degree centigrade over the last century. But the blue line denotes the temperatures in the Arctic, and they have been increasing at a faster rate, and they are much warmer today than ever before. This is one feedback that exists in the Arctic, and another feedback is the methane release feedback. There are regions of the globe around the Arctic that are permanently frozen. The permafrost regions are denoted in this dark blue. These are regions that have stayed frozen since the last ice age, but they're beginning to thaw. And as a result, they are releasing methane. Methane, natural gas, is something that is naturally uh, found in swamps and other places where you have vegetative decay. And that methane has remained trapped under the permafrost since before the ice age. But now that the permafrost is thawing, it's releasing methane so much that you could ignite it, just like the burner on your stove. We have seen methane emissions increase from half a million tons per year 20 years ago to over 17 million tons released in 2013. This is a problem that's accelerating. Because of the feedback, the ice albedo feedback, because of the methane feedback, what happens in the Arctic affects the entire climate system. And because of these feedbacks, it turns out the Arctic is one of the most sensitive places to the climate that's happening elsewhere in the world. And the more I learned about this, and the more I understood the problem, the more compelled I felt to do something about it. So in 2013, I taught a class with my colleagues here at ASU, Hillary Hartnett and Chris Grappi, uh, where we explored these issues, and we explored a possible technology that I um, came up with for possibly restoring some of the sea ice and restoring the Arctic to its cooling role in the climate. We taught this class and we explored some of these aspects of this technology, and then finally, uh, we published our results in the refereed journal Earth's Future, and this is a copy of the paper, and all the students were made co-authors, something that we're quite proud of. The idea uh, expressed in this paper is one, we have to do something about the Arctic, but also here's something that might work. And the idea is quite simple. If you had a device, a buoy, that you put out into the ocean in a place where multi-year ice was not forming, and you left it there in the summer, then as the winter came and the ice started to freeze around it, uh, this buoy would support a uh, wind turbine, and there is plentiful wind power in the Arctic, even through the Arctic winter. And that wind power could be used to raise water from below the sea ice, which is only a few meters thick, raise it up to above the sea ice, where it would be held in a tank until distributed, and then distributed over the ice, where it would freeze more rapidly. Right now, the freezing of seawater into sea ice is limited once the ice gets to be more than a few meters thick, because the ocean is relatively warm, and the cold part is on the top. By putting the water on top, it freezes faster, and we've calculated these effects. By our calculations, we estimate that one device like this could increase the thickness of sea ice over the course of one Arctic winter by about one meter over an area of a tenth of a square kilometer. Now, one meter doesn't sound like a lot, but these are the average depths of the sea ice throughout the Arctic, and it's no more than a few meters, and in most places, it's less than a meter. So if you could add one meter, to the thickness of the ice, you would significantly increase the volume of ice that's there. And we estimate that 10 million devices distributed over a million square kilometers, 10% uh, of the area of the Arctic, could actually produce 1,000 cubic kilometers of ice extra per year and offset the loss of ice that we're seeing. 10 million, that seems like a big number, 
But I want to remind you that we make in this country 10 million cars every year, and these are not as complicated as cars. So it's something that we decided in the paper is feasible, doable. And if we could employ these, we might see 10 million of these devices increase the amount of ice and restore the, the ice that's there. Now, to be sure, we're not trying to solve all of the world's climate change problems. We can't until CO2 emissions are brought under control. But what we are advocating is studying this method for reducing the worst of the feedbacks, for uh, pushing on the brake rather than the accelerator in the Arctic. Now, this may sound like uh, geoengineering, and it is. It's a project where we are purposely intervening in the climate to change something about it. But we think it's relatively benign compared to some standard geoengineering concepts, such as uh, stratospheric aerosol injection, where sulfuric acid is sprayed into the stratosphere, suspend it there for months to reflect back sunlight that will cool the earth but with other effects. Or uh, iron fertilization of the oceans, where iron is poured into the ocean to help fertilize the growth of plankton, which would draw down CO2. These are ideas which have been discussed, and uh, each of them has effects, and our project may also have effects that we haven't thought through, but the point is that um, it's relatively benign, because all we're doing is trying to get a natural process to go a little bit faster to restore the ice to the state that it existed in just 20 years ago. Our next steps are to build and test a prototype to see if such a device could actually survive the Arctic winter and whether it would thicken the ice uh, as advertised. And to improve the modeling, we need to understand how this would affect ice in the Arctic, uh, spraying salt water over ice, can weaken it, we need to understand all of these things. But if the choice is to not have ice or to have this ice, uh, we think that it's better. But we need to model it all. And our goal is to provoke a technical discussion and also a non-technical discussion. It's important to widen the dialogue, to bring in the relevant stakeholders and the people who live in the Arctic and discuss the ethics of such projects and who would manage such projects. And I just want to leave you with one final thought, which is that climate change is a big problem, and the loss of sea ice in the Arctic is staggering in its scope. But Climate change is an accidental byproduct of our great industrial capacity. And we have the ability to do great things. And if one small fraction of our capacity was directed at solving these problems, I have every hope that we can restore the ice in the Arctic and buy us time to work on all the other problems too. We have great powers as a species. We have great imagination and innovative capability as a species. What we don't have is time. Thank you. Thank you.